Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. This will be the last hour of torture for your name. So, what? Oh, who said yay? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> it's hurtful, actually. <laughs> but yeah, sure. Okay, so again, this is me, that's my email, um, and the notes are on that website. So we are going to talk about hypothyroidism in the dog. Um, and honestly, from a laboratory perspective, we run about 5,000 thyroid profiles a day uh, through the lab. So we see a lot of numbers. Um, it's very confusing. And so what we're going to try and do as we go through this is kind of demystify why it's not that easy from a lab perspective to diagnose hypothyroidism and why it really comes down to us as a clinician to take all the information together, including the thyroid function test, to try and help sort it out. So we're going to review a little bit about normal uh, thyroid physiology, which I think will help us understand some of the limitations of the test. I will talk specifically about etiology of hypothyroidism as we've learned more about it uh, from large databases like Antic, IDEX, Machine State. We'll talk about the specific thyroid function test and the role of thyroid function testing. And then at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about dose uh, of thyroid hormone and, and when and why to monitor thyroid hormone uh, treatment. So first of all, when we look at the normal physiology, it is a classic positive and negative uh, endocrine feedback loop. So it all starts with pituitary release of thyrotropin or TSH, which stimulates the thyroid to produce uh, two hormones, both T3 and T4. Remember that most of T3 is actually intracellular, so we don't really pay much attention to serum levels. And total T4 levels, uh, while T4 is the most abundant hormone uh, that's produced, it's not the biologically active hormone. The biologically active hormone is actually free T4, which diffuses into the cell, gets converted into free T3, which then goes into the nucleus of the cell and exerts the biologic effect. But what T4 does do is it serves as a huge reservoir of circulating T4 in the blood and serves to feed back the level of the pituitary and the level of the hypothalamus to shut off further secretion of TRH and TSH. Now, there are several differences between uh, what goes on in dog and cats and people with respect to thyroid hormone. Uh, people have way more thyroid hormone in their blood than do dogs or cats. So it's a little bit problematic uh, for human laboratories, even though we use the same assay that they use, they don't run quality control or cutoffs down at the low end. And so, you know, in the days when we used to send samples to a human lab or if there's somewhere where you have to send it to a human lab, you have to be a little bit worried about the low end in diagnosing hypo because we're not sure where their cutoffs are. Part of the reason for the difference is the way thyroid hormones carry. 60% of it in dogs is bound to TBG or thyroid binding globulin. Some of it's bound to thyroid binding prealbumin, albumin, and some of the high density lipoprotein. And the significance of that is that any disease state that lowers the concentration of these binding proteins or affects the affinity of T4 for these binding proteins will cause the total T4 in the blood to be lower than what you would expect in the absence of, of hypothyroidism. So a lot of non-thyroidal illness causes the total T4 to be low because of binding abnormalities. The other big difference between humans and dogs is the half-life. And the half-life of T4 in a dog is 10 to 16 hours, and the half-life of T4 in a person is 7 days. So they get very paranoid in people about the dose of thyroid hormone replacement, because once they give that dose, it's going to be uh, present in the circulation. And because the half-life is so short in dogs, what you probably have noticed is that the dose for dogs is way higher than the dose in people. So the dose in a person is 0.1 or 0.075 milligrams for a 70 kilogram person once a day. And the dose for a dog is somewhere around a tenth of a milligram per 10 pounds, and some people dose that twice a day. We'll come back to the dose later. And so what you may notice if you call a human pharmacy for a prescription, a full prescription for a dog, the pharmacist may say, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know, because you're calling in and say, I want 0.4 milligrams for Buffy twice a day, and they're going, well, that seems kind of goofy because that's way higher than what we do with people. And you just say, well, you probably are aware that dogs only have 15% of TBG in the half-life 10 to 16 hours, and they're blow it out of your butt. It's full of <laughs> But that's, that is the issue. Most pharmacists are nice. I mean, let's get to it. They're, they're nice people. 
The other reason, though, it becomes a bit of an issue is that in people, they're very paranoid about overdosing on thyroid hormone replacement because even being suddenly overdosed with T4 for replacement therapy, especially if you're female and you're postmenopausal and you have osteoporosis, is that it increases your likelihood of stroke and heart attack and bone fracture and atrial fibrillation, none of which are trivial. And so they're very concerned about how much thyroid hormone you take, and they're very religious at monitoring your total T4. Because the half-life in dogs is so short, and it's mainly excreted in the bile and then into the GI tract, there is more thyroid hormone in the backyards in North America than there are in the pills. So whoever designed the dog knew that we were going to give them a lot of thyroid hormone, and the dog just is equipped to defecate it out. So if we look at all of the causes of hypothyroidism in dogs, uh, thyroiditis versus atrophy versus congenital versus tumors versus secondary or tertiary. The first two, lymphocytic thyroiditis and idiopathic atrophy, probably account for more than 90% of what we see. And the other things, while they occur, um, they usually occur under very bizarre circumstances and clinically would be very hard uh, to differentiate these because these are ge generally, these last three are not going to be showing clinical signs of hypothyroidism. Uh, these dogs will definitely show signs of hypothyroidism because they're dwarfs. So lymphocytic atrophy or lymphocytic, I should say lymphocytic thyroiditis accounts for at least 50% of the cases, so it's probably the most common. Uh, this is a true autoimmune endocrine disorder, so the dog has uh, circulating antithyroglobulin, antimicrosomal antibodies directed against the thyroid gland. And normally the thyroid has a very uh, well-established thyroid blood barrier. And thyroglobin, which is the protein that sits on side, inside the thyroid follicular cells, serves as a scaffold. So thyroglobin sits there as a big protein. Iodine gets taken out of the blood, incorporated uh, into, uh, or iodinated on the tyrosine residues on the top of the thyroglobin. And the peripheral circulation never sees thyroglobin because it's never released from the gland. What happens with thyroiditis is that the gland is damaged, it's leaking, thyroglobin leaks into the blood, and we can measure these antibodies in the peripheral circulation. We know that it's an autoimmune disease because if we box the thyroids in addition to these antibodies, we see a lymphocytic uh, plasmacytic infiltrate in the gland. And over time, and that time could be weeks to months to years, the dog goes from having thyroiditis, the presence of antibodies, and lymphocytic infiltration, to then losing thyroid mass and eventually losing thyroid function, but they have to lose probably 85 to 90% of the gland uh, before thyroid function actually becomes low because there's a huge reservoir there. And the presence of these circulating uh, markers, these anti-thyroglobulin, anti-microsomal antibodies, serve as a marker for thyroiditis, but they do not make a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. So you can have uh, thyroiditis again for weeks to months to years before the occurrence of hypothyroidism. So we don't use these to diagnose hypothyroidism or to decide if the patient needs treatment. The value of these is really uh, when we're looking at uh, breeding populations. Um, lymphocytic thyroiditis is thought to be heritable. In the dog, we don't know what gene or genes are involved, but there's strong uh, genetic predispositions. And so there are um, thyroid uh, panels that are offered as part of certification so that your dog can be certified as having a normal thyroid. And that's done through the OFA thyroid registry. And what happens with that registry is that the dog has a blood sample drawn, they have to be at least one year of age, and then they have blood drawn on an annual basis for as long as they want to stay in the registry. And what we do is we measure T4, free T4 by dialysis, TSH, and antithyroglobin and antibody. If everything's normal or negative, then they get a thyroid registry number and you can pass that along to other breeders. <clears throat> the problem right now with the registry is not the intent, it's really it's a good thing. Um, you want to screen out and remove from the gene pool those dogs that are positive. But the problem right now is since we don't know the, the gene that's defective, um, you can have a dog who goes in and he's normal at age one, he's normal at age two, and then at age three he goes in and he's positive for antithyroid love and antibody but he's been used for breeding for the last two years. So once he goes positive, he has to be removed, but it doesn't preclude him from being used uh, or her used for breeding prior to that. Idiopathic atrophy accounts for the next big conglomeration of cases. And as the name implies, we have no idea what the hell this is. Um, we used to think it was end-stage thyroiditis. 
So by the time you saw the dogs, they're antibody negative, you biopsy the thyroid and there's nothing there. There's no inflammatory infiltrate there. We don't think there's any role of antithyroid antibodies in this disease. What we do think is that it's a metabolic disease, that it has nothing to do with an autoimmune component. The dog's born with a normal thyroid, develops normally, and then between the ages of one and four or one and five, develops a metabolic defect within his gland, and his gland starts to atrophy, decreases in size, eventually 85-90% of the gland is gone, total T4 levels drop, and the animal becomes hypothyroid. The good thing about this is that even though we don't have a marker for it, we don't need it because it's not felt to be heroin. Uh, it's felt to be um, just an idiosyncratic reaction that happens in the dog. Clinically, you can't tell an idiopathic atrophy dog uh, from a lymphocytic thyroiditis dog. They, they look the same. And the onset, again, of the atrophy till the time of development uh, of hypothyroidism is going to be uh, incredibly variable. I'll show you some data later on of dogs who were antibody positive who then went on to become hypothyroid and how long it takes for that disease process to occur. Thyroid tumors in cats cause hyperthyroidism. Thyroid tumors in dogs can cause hyperthyroidism, but only about 7% of dogs uh, with a palpable thyroid mass are actually hyperthyroid. Um, in one study, 40% of dogs with uh, thyroid tumors were felt to be hypothyroid, but that was based solely on measuring total T4. And as we're going to continually say, total T4 is, as a standalone test to diagnose hypothyroidism are not very good. So most of these animals were probably, in fact, euthyroid that had a low total T4 uh, because they were sick, because uh, they were systemically ill. And with thyroid tumors, you know, the dog gets a bilobe thyroid in the neck. So to have a thyroid tumor causing hypothyroidism, it would have to be bilateral, uh, which would be exceedingly weird in the dog. Congenital hypothyroidism is actually a very common cause of hypothyroidism in people. Uh, all newborns uh, in the United States are screened for congenital hypothyroidism within the first 72 hours uh, with, by measuring total T4. Uh, it seems to be pretty rare in dogs and cats. Uh, what we primarily see with congenital hypothyroidism is uh, a dwarf. So these are going to be puppies or kittens that are short stature, open growth plates, uh, retain deciduous teeth, retain puppy or kitten hair coats. Uh, they're very unintelligent animals, uh, very dull. Most of the time, this is a primary defect within the thyroid. Either they don't take uh, iodine across uh, into the thyroid from the blood, or once they bring iodine into the thyroid, they can no longer organify it and put it on the tyrosine. Uh, cats with congenital hypothyroidism, in addition to being a dwarf, often have a goiter in their neck. So you'll feel a palpable mass uh, in the mid-cervical area. There is a central form of congenital hypothyroidism, uh, suspected in giant schnauzers. These are schnauzers that are stunted. Uh, these are schnauzers that also have a congenital B12 deficiency. And so in addition to being hypothyroid, they also have chronic diarrhea. So they're a mess. And as far as we know, they're not related. The B12 issue and the uh, hypothyroidism are not related. It's important to recognize the congenital hypothyroid arcs for what they are pretty early, because if we treat them with thyroid hormone supplement before the ages of five or six months, they'll probably gain adult height. Uh, but if we don't get them until later, then they'll uh, be uh, stunted forever. And if we get them fairly late, the problem is, and their biases close late, they'll have a lot of arthritis uh, when they get older. Secondary hypothyroidism means your thyroid gland is normal, but your problem is you don't have TSH. And there's two scenarios where we see this in dogs. One is as a congenital defect. Uh, again, these are animals that present as dwarfs. Um, this is primarily seen in breeds like German Shepherds, where they have something called the cystic rapti's pouch. And so what happens <coughs> is, is that the pituitary normally forms by neural tissue migrating down from the brain and epithelium migrating up from the oral cavity. What happens with the shepherds is that nothing migrates down, the oral cavity tissue migrates up and forms a cyst. And there is no uh, endocrine tissue present in that cyst. They can have an isolated TSH deficiency and just be hypothyroid, but they often lack multiple anterior pituitary hormones. So they lack growth hormone, they lack FSH and LH, they um, lack prolactin, they can lack um, all of these hormones. But usually the thing that's most striking about the dogs is the dwarfism. And then the second time when we can see secondary hypothyroidism are in older animals, 
where they have a pituitary tumor that's destroying the TSH-producing cell and or compressing the hypothalamus uh, where it's causing a problem with TRH release. Usually these dogs don't present for hypothyroid signs, they present for signs of a, a pituitary mass. And then TRH deficiencies, the least common cause, been reported in people following head trauma, uh, following neoplastic or infiltrative disease in the CNS. Again, they don't show up as being hypothyroid, they show up because they have uh, intracranial disease, and then they're subsequently found to be hypothyroid. Does it occur in dogs? I'm not 100% sure. Again, I think if it does occur in dogs, we would diagnose uh, primary CNS disease uh, before we'd be diagnosing their thyroid condition. Now, we have really good data on incidence for lots of endocrine diseases in dogs. We know one in 1,200 dogs gets diagnosed with Cushing's, one in three or 400 get diagnosed with diabetes, uh, one in 300 cats gets diagnosed with hyperthyroidism, but we don't know the incidence of hypothyroidism in dogs, partly because we don't have good databases because there's no agreement on what criteria are you using to diagnose hypothyroidism. A lot of the data comes from uh, referral hospitals, tertiary care centers, where they tend to see bizarre cases, they tend to see overrepresentation of purebred dogs, um, and again, the diagnostic criteria was it diagnosed based on total T4, total T4, pre T4, TSH, TSH, then syntigraphy biopsy. So it gets to be a little bit uh, difficult. I think that it's probably safe to say it's not the most common endocrine disorder in the dog. It's probably safe to say it's the most overly diagnosed endocrine disorder in the dog, <coughs> simply because so many people rely on uh, just looking at total T4. We do know some things about the disease, and that is age of diagnosis is very important. 46% uh, are diagnosed between the ages of one and three. Uh, these are dogs with lymphocytic thyroiditis, autoimmune disease. Another 30% are diagnosed between the ages of four and six. This is idiopathic atrophy. And it's very rare for older dogs, dogs 10 years of age or older, to become hypothyroid. But it's very common for dogs over the age of 10 to have a low total T4. And the older dogs with low total T4s probably have a low total T4 because they're sick, they have some other disease, or they're taking a medication which is known to lower uh, total T4. Severe gender predisposition, uh, two and a half times more common in female than male. This reflects the autoimmune nature of the disease, which again, all autoimmune endocrine disorders in dogs, diabetes, hypothyroidism, Addison's hypoparathyroidism, all more common in females uh, than in males. Don't think it's a hormone thing per se, uh, because these animals tend to be spayed or neutered. Probably more related to whatever the genetic defect is that's causing the autoimmune disorder is probably uh, traveling in concert with the sex chromosome. This is where I become a very unpopular speaker at breed clubs. Um, so this is the this is the most a list of the most common breeds as of now. Um, that are being diagnosed with hypothyroidism. The number one breed right now is the golden retriever. This has, you know, this this takes into account the relative, uh, you know, popularity of the breed. The problem with golden retrievers is that they're too popular. And for whatever things that we like about goldens in terms of their personality, how they look, uh, their body conformation, all of that stuff, as we breed for those characteristics, we've also started to uh, select for the defects that are traveling with those conditions. Uh, for instance, we all know that cancer is crazy common in Goldens, uh, lymphomas, mangiosarcomas. Uh, we have a breeder who's got a line of Golden Retrievers in LA and Seattle. The last two years, uh, 130 dogs with confirmed mangiosarc, another 30 dogs that dropped in hemo something uh, but never had a necropsy. Uh, crazy amount of lymphomas. A lot of work being done to look at Golden Retrievers in terms of lack of tumor suppressor genes that are predisposing them to these diseases. Uh, same issues with uh, hypothyroidism, which, and this is lymphocytic thyroiditis. Um, so whatever is causing that, whatever genetic mutation seems to be going along with uh, neoplasia. And pit bulls aren't part of that? I seem to see a lot of pit bulls. Um, no, they're not on the list. Now, a pit bull in the diagnostic laboratory setting is questionable. Yeah, how people are coding for that in practice. 
because um, a lot of times they don't get coded as a pit bull, like in LA, that's, you know, we don't usually put that into the database because it's all, yeah, they're, they're <laughs> everything. Yeah, yeah, they become yeah. users because otherwise they have to pay $300 to the city to get a license for their pit bull. We're very fond of pit bulls in LA. We have two dogs in LA, the most common pit bulls and chihuahuas. Um, definitely different uh, climate in terms of uh, money. Um, the little dogs belong to the ritzy people, the pit bulls belong to the not so ritzy people, and the pit bulls love chihuahuas, so it's actually good for us. <laughs> okay, back to the Golden Retriever. So I gave a, a lecture at the, breed, the National Breed Club of Golden Retrievers and basically said, you just got to quit breeding them, and I sat down. So, <laughs> you know, the only way to sort out the mess is to stop the madness and let's find another breed that we want to mess up. So, um, that went over uniformly poorly. Um, but this is a breed for which the OFA testing, uh, I think, has value. Also a breed for which we're probably going to be using together with Dobermans to try and find a gene uh, because there's such a strong uh, relationship. Uh, Doberman pinchers, insanely messed up dogs from an immune standpoint, uh, a very high incidence of lymphocytic thyroiditis, a lot of 50% of Dobermans in one study, healthy Dobermans were positive on anti-thyroid blood and antibody testing. Um, not surprisingly, the Dobermans that were brought into the U.S. Uh, 40 or 50 years ago uh, for breeding brought with them two diseases, von Willebrand's disease and hypothyroidism. They don't seem to be uh, genetically related to each other or causally related to each other. Um, but what we do think is that Doberman pinchers have one functional B lymphocyte in their body, uh, and it's making antibodies against the thyroid gland. <laughs> uh, dachshunds a very high incidence of immune-mediated uh, thyroid disease, um, and as well as Shetland sheep dogs. Probably the dogs with the highest level of antibody that we see in the blood are from Shelties. Uh, the Sheltie breed clubs are all aware of this. Uh, Irish setters. Does anybody have horses? Oh, fantastic. So the Irish setter and the horse are the same. They're, they're basically evolutionary dead ends that never should have been allowed to survive. So the horse should have been gone a long time ago. Um, I'm not sure how I got into veterinary school, but when I interviewed for vet school, it was at the time when you walk into a big room with a big table surrounded by... Uh, 12 men who are 95 years old in white lab coat. And I sat down at the table and they said, name three breeds of pig. And I said, seriously, this is how this is going to go? Because it's going to go poorly. <laughs> I had, first of all, there's more than one with my standard answer to all of their questions. There's more than one kind of sheep or pig or goat. And I said, look, I'll sign a piece of paper right now. So if I don't touch any of those animals, I will eat them, but I will not care for them. And I'm not here for that stuff. I just want to skip through all that. They just stared at me. And I pretty much figured when it was all said and done that I was going to go to, you know, somewhere else. And then they let me into vet in school. And then I got into vet school and I went to anatomy lab and I met the horse. The first time I'd actually ever seen a horse was a horse formalized. And I became instantly appalled by the evolutionary adaptation of the species. So here's an animal that weighs a whole lot. His brain and the cat brain, roughly the same size, to be perfectly honest on legs that basically break when you're just staring at them, and it has a GI tract that makes 40 lethal turns. And you're sitting there wondering, well, why do they call it? Because they're messed up. That's why they call it. They're, they're going to die. Just let them go. So <laughs> the same thing as the Irish setter. The Irish setter serves no earthly purpose. If you watch Irish setters walk, it's, it's not normal. Their, their gait analysis is completely messed up. There's times when they're moving forward, all four feet are on the ground. There's times when they're moving forward and none of their feet are touching the ground. There's, there's no innovation uh, to that breed. So them and the horse, they should just disappear. And then this is probably the best news for veterinarians. The Cocker Spaniel is declining in popularity. The AKC rankings is plummeting. Um, the pet owners finally, yeah, they realize that we've known for decades. They're smelling mean dogs. Um, so they don't serve any purpose. And so... I have a couple of things that I like to, to teach young doctors is that, first of all, with golden retrievers, when you're talking to a golden retriever puppy owner and you're talking about vaccines and deworming and spay and neuter, just slide the word splenectomy in there. 
<laughs> the animals coming in today for a space night. And they're going to go, what, what, what? Smiley? Yeah, they don't need it. We're just going to take it out. Because if you leave it in, it's just going to kill the dog. So just take it out. But, and I think that was really the reason why the Golden Retriever people didn't have me back. And then <laughs> Cocker Spaniels again. You know, spay so your vaccines. We're going to bring them in today. We're going to do this thing called the bilateral total ear canal. Yeah. <laughs> and some of the owners are pretty smart. They're going to go, hmm. Will he be able to hear afterwards? You go, you don't understand. In two years, he's going to be deaf anyway. And not only will he be deaf, he'll be angry about it. So let's just remove his ear canals and everything will be fine. Now, one of the problems with hypothyroidism in, uh, for you and for me clinically, and then when we get to the lab where it gets all magnified, is that if you think about well, what is it that thyroid hormone does in the body? And so what it's supposed to do is regulate metabolic rate. And it regulates metabolic rate in every tissue in your body, but it does so to a varying degree. So you can see clinical signs of hypothyroidism in every single organ system, in which case it's very simple. Or you can have only one organ system that's being affected, in which case 10 other diseases can look clinically just like that. And so the diseases that are most commonly associated with hypothyroidism are dermatologic signs, uh, reproduction, hematologic, cardiovascular, and neurologic. So, Let's just talk briefly about some of these things, reproductive. A lot of uh, interest, especially on the part of breeding folks that, uh, in uh, breed clubs, that hypothyroidism is common in their breed, and therefore these dogs need to be on supplements so that they can effectively breed more, which always is bizarre. You give them a drug because they're messed up so they can have more puppies. Okay, well, that sounds good. So we've had two studies now that have taken intact male dogs, made them hypothyroid, and then followed their reproductive performance. And the same thing with intact female dogs, experimentally made of hypothyroid and followed their reproductive performance. And basically, there isn't any adverse effect on reproductive performance. And in terms of litter size, um, number of uh, puppies being born, all of those things, reproductive cycle. The one thing that does show up in male dogs is that it takes the hypothyroid male dog, dog longer to cross the floor to get to the bitch and eat. Um, but otherwise, when he gets there, life is good. And for female dogs, what we typically see is they have an erratic intra-estrous interval. So they go into heat, and three months later, they're in heat, and they go out, and then a year later, they're in heat. But when they're in heat and they're bred, there doesn't seem to be any effect on fertility. So as far as we can tell, it doesn't seem to be a big deal. Uh, cardiovascular, there were papers uh, many years ago showing a link or a, a probable link between uh, dilated cardiomyopathy and hypothyroidism in the Doberman Pinscher. It ends up being that that was not the case, that what was happening is that those were Dobermans with DCM that were being diagnosed with hypothyroidism based solely on a low T4. And the reality is, is that their T4 was low because they were dying of dilated cardiomyopathy. However, there are two good studies now showing a relationship cause and effect between dilated cardiomyopathy and hypothyroidism in Great Danes. So if you have a Great Dane, especially a young Dane that's being diagnosed with DCM, probably should get screened for hypothyroidism because it's reversible. It's sort of like DCM in a cat with taurine deficiency. Uh, so we probably should screen those cats, and, or those dogs. And neurologically, uh, things like laryngeal paralysis and megasophagus, people look for a link between that and hypothyroidism. That doesn't seem to be there. But there are some neurologic diseases that do seem to be associated. Uh, one is unilateral or bilateral facial nerve paralysis in the absence of otitis externa. Uh, so if you have a dog with unilateral bilateral facial nerve disease, the ear canals look clean, I probably would screen them for hypothyroidism because it's reversible, um, the paralysis is. And then the other is a lower motor neuron disorder seen in young to middle-aged large breed dogs. So these are dogs that are coming in with Decreased uh, rhythm and weakness, rhythm ataxia, decreased tendon reflexes, decreased muscle tone. They look like uh, coon hound paralysis, tick paralysis, botulism. And in a subset of those dogs, that's related to hypothyroidism and it's reversible. So those two disorders neurologically uh, seem to be associated with hypothyroidism, but the other ones we don't really have good association. <coughs> What about, what about like hyper, hypercholesterolemia and lipid deposits in the corneas? Like I heard that, that low thyroid is related to that too. Well, um, the question was about lipid deposits in the cornea and hypercholesterolemia. You can see lipid abnormalities in hypothyroid dogs uh, for sure, 
most of the dogs that have those corneal opacities from lipid deposition have normal thyroid function, but I agree it's probably reasonable to screen for that. Um, hypo, hypercholesterolemia is a poor predictor of thyroid status in the dog. So when we actually want to confirm hypothyroidism with a thyroid function test, we're really wanting to confirm our clinical suspicion. We want to be able to distinguish a truly hypothyroid dog from a sick euthyroid dog. And we may want to have some way of testing uh, to monitor treatment, which we'll talk about at the end. So I think that where we still want to start is by measuring total T4. And the reason we want to start with total T4 is that the vast majority of your patients are normal. So you might as well screen them with the test that's simple, um, and we'll, we'll do that. Um, and for our lab, and depending on what lab you use, they probably have a cutoff, but for us, anything greater than 1.5 rules it out. Anything less than 1.5 does not rule it in. So anything less than 1.5 requires additional uh, thyroid testing. Because the problem is all the things that we're going to talk about that can result in a low total T4 uh, in the face of new thyroidism. I'd also warn you that the use of in-house total T4 testing is fraught with error. Um, in one paper, it's basically 50%. So I wouldn't do that. Just send it out to an outside lab. <coughs> you don't need, I've never seen the need for a SAT T4. I've never had a dog that needs thyroid hormone before it goes home or a cat that needs half as all before it goes home. Send it, I don't care where you send it, but send it to an outside lab uh, and let them measure it. So what we do know about um, things that will cause the total T4 to be low in the face of normal thyroid function is time of day. Dogs and cats are episodic secretors, so it could be that the time you pull that blood sample, you just happen to pull in at nadir, and so you can get a total T4 test that's low even though they're completely normal. And that happens in 50% of normal dogs. We'll have a total T4 that's below reference range at least once during the course of the day. So if you have a completely normal dog, and for some reason you got back a T4 that was low, I probably would go to the owner and say, you know, your dog's asymptomatic, is he taking any medication? And if he's not, I'd say, look, you know, let's just retest him on a different day and see what the result is. Uh, most of the time, calling into the lab and having us rerun it um, doesn't help your cause. Because the problem is, is that if it's a low, for, and again, for our lab, if the T4 is low or high, we automatically rerun it. And so the report, the result we're giving you is already getting retested. So to call in and say, can you retest it's not going to help, just send in uh, another blood sample. We also know that age has an effect. Puppies up to the age of about three months have two to five times higher amounts of T4 in their blood uh, than do adult dogs. And this has to do with the amount of TBG in their blood. And so when we're looking at thyroid function tests in puppies, it's a different reference range. After they're three months of age, what we will see is an age-dependent decline in geriatric dogs, but it's an age-dependent decline within the reference range. So again, an older dog with a low T4 is usually sick or on a drug, um, is usually not a, a dog with spontaneous hypothyroidism. Then there's breed problems. Uh, when I was in Kansas, I figured out that uh, people were the third most common species. So it was cattle then greyhounds, and then humans. And the Greyhound Racing Commission actually um, had our lab do some studies on looking at what's the matter with greyhounds, because they were constantly getting reports from greyhounds on the track and greyhounds that were being adopted that all these greyhounds are hypothyroid uh, because their T4s were always much lower than other dogs. And what we ended up finding is that greyhounds, and in fact all sighthounds, greyhounds, wolfhounds, afghans, borzois, uh, now we've seen uh, the Sengis as well, other breeds. They just have less T4 in their blood than other breeds do. And so what we really need are breed-specific normals um, because greyhounds have about half the amount of total T4 in their blood, also lower amounts of free T4 in their blood. And so in order to accurately tell you whether a greyhound or some of these sighthounds is hypothyroid, uh, requires us being able to give you a breed-specific reference range for that. Can I, can I that yeah? So... If you say 50% of greyhounds and Afghans or whatever have no, low... No, 100% of them have low ones. Oh, 100%? 50% of normal value. Okay. But even if it is, say, 100%, how, how can you distinguish that from a genetic disease? I mean... Well, when 100% when of the population has it, it's not a genetic disease. It's normal. So what we do is we... What we did is we looked at greyhounds that were on the track 
and were exposed to steroids, because you may not believe this, the greyhounds on the track were juiced. <laughs> so we looked at the greyhounds on the track, we looked at retired racing greyhounds that were off the track, we looked at greyhounds that were bred for show that never saw a track, and what we found is that the T4s were the same. They're all low. And so that's just normal for them. And what constitutes hypothyroidism in a greyhound is something that would be incredibly much lower than that. And in fact, hypothyroidism in sight hounds is very rare. And I think it's because they don't get autoimmune thyroiditis. Um, you know, that's just not part of their makeup. Part of the reason why people were looking at thyroid tests in greyhounds is because they found these low T4s and the greyhounds didn't have any hair on their thighs, inner thighs and back of their thighs. Well, freaking guess what? They're not supposed to. And if you see a, a hairy greyhound, that's a sick greyhound. You know, that one's got something wrong with it. So you're not supposed to grow hair where you're not supposed to grow hair. They're just not supposed to have them. This was a very disturbing study that came out in 2010 looking at uh, side hounds and Salukis because Salukis is another breed that has much lower T4 levels. And what they had done is that veterinarians had submitted blood samples to the lab um, and got back results that said that the total T4 is below despite the fact that they were given instructions saying, hey, this is a side hound breed, this is the reference range for side hounds. And then they called the veterinarians as a follow-up and said, what did you end up doing with that particular dog? And what they found was that 76% of the vets diagnosed the dog as being hypothyroid based on a low total T4 by itself, despite the fact that they got a sheet that said they weren't. 7.5% diagnosed the animal with hypothyroid, hypothyroidism despite the fact the numbers were completely freaking normal. And this is 7.5% of the population that's just demented. This doesn't reflect bad vets. These are just bad people. Um, they, they shouldn't be voting or driving cars or doing anything. <laughs> so 83% of the time, they, they made the wrong diagnosis. So from a lab perspective, this is very depressing. So we try, you know, when we report out the results, to give you um, the results in a reference range and figure it out. But if you have any questions, especially with site hound breeds, just call. Um, because we can give you the reference ranges for those. The biggest problem we have with total T4 testing, though, is this problem of non-thyroidal illness, also called the euthyroid sick syndrome. So when you get sick, or a dog gets sick, or a cat gets sick with some disease, they start to secrete a lot of hormones, a lot of inflammatory mediators that start to affect lots of things. Certainly they can affect the pituitary and decrease TSH, but what they tend to more commonly do is cause binding protein abnormalities or decrease the concentration of binding protein. And the first thing that typically happens is that as the patient gets sick, the total T3 level drops, <coughs> then the total T4 level drops. It's not telling you anything about thyroid function, but it is a really good predictor of mortality. So the lower the total T4 a person has on admission to ICU, and the lower the total T4 is in a cat on admission to ICU, the less likely it is that they're going to get out of ICU. Now, when people first started recognizing this, non-thyroidal illness and uh, causing low total T4 and affecting survival. Studies, lots of studies were done saying, well, what happens if we give sick rats and sick mice and sick people thyroid hormone? And basically, everything, every study showed the same thing. And the best example of this was a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago. They took 2,500 people who went to surgery for uh, bypass, coronary artery bypass. These people were having heart attacks. They had occlusion, they went into the OR, and they had surgery. When they came out of the OR, they all had low total T4. And they randomized them into two groups. Half of the group got thyroid hormone replacement therapy beginning on day one, the other group got placebo. And they followed these people out till time of discharge to the hospital and beyond. What they found was that the people that got thyroid hormone supplementation had better blood pressure, better cardiac output, decreased peripheral uh, resistance, and a 30% higher mortality rate than the people that got placebo. So what happened was they published this, this article, and this is like the four millionth article that says giving thyroid hormone to sick people is really a stupid thing to do, but yet they recreated it and did it. The article was accompanied by an editorial, and the editorial was written by an endocrinologist, admittedly the smartest people on the face of the planet. And the, the guy who wrote the editorial was a guy named Robert Utiger, who incidentally wrote a book called The Thyroid. And so, you know, usually you don't mess with those guys because they know they're talking about. He said, really, we need to stop this. When you give a hormone that raises the metabolic rate to people that are sick, it kills them. So you need to stop that. The reason that the total T4 is low in these people is because they're dealing with the fact that they're systemically ill 
they don't need their metabolic rate to be at 100%. They actually, it's a good thing that their metabolic rate is low. So in people, they're very freaked out about giving thyroid hormone supplement to ill people without a firm diagnosis of hypothyroidism. In dogs, we do it all the time, but I think we survive, and the dogs survive because they just defecate down. The half-life is so short. On that note, um, I know hyperthyroidism in cats is, is a different disease, but mm -hmm. if you have a very ill hyperthyroid cat, like it's got liver cancer or GI foreign body and just had surgery, should you take it off its capsule while it's recovering? Uh, or should you up it? Or like well, you don't want it to be low. So he would be better being higher normal than low. If he was low, I would take him off. If he wasn't low, I would leave him on. You know, there's no reason to stop it. Uh, unless his T4 was too low, in which case that's a bad deal whether you're a sick cat or not a sick cat. But if his T4 was being controlled at that dose of tapazole, I would just leave him alone. Yeah, he doesn't... He, he but you wouldn't want his thyroid to be higher no. or lower. No, you, you want it to be normal. Yeah, you want it to be normal. Um, these are all diseases that we know in dogs will lower the total T4. Just being in an ICU setting will lower total T4. And in one study, cats... cats Dogs that went into a boarding facility and had a total T4 measured at time of admission to the boarding facility had a low T4 seven days later, just being in the boarding facility. So just the stress of being somewhere new will, will cause your total T4 to be low. Medications are a nightmare. If you look at Goodman and Gilman, you look in the PER, pick any drug you want, I guarantee somewhere in there it messes up your thyroid. It either messes up T4, it messes up TSH, it messes up antibodies. These are drugs that we know in dogs will affect thyroid function because we have studies. Certainly glucocorticoids, phenobar, sulfonamide containing antibiotics, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. This is a big problem in the lab because we see a lot of dogs, older dogs with low T4s, and a lot of those dogs are on the NSAID. And they're not hypothyroid. They don't need to be on thyroid hormone supplement. And in fact, it's bad for them to go on supplement if they don't need it because when you give them the thyroid hormone, now the NSAID and the thyroid hormone are competing for those binding proteins and it's going to dissociate the NSAID. So we just have to make sure that if they're on any of these medications, be aware it's going to be very difficult to make a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. And for sure it's going to require um, probably looking at things like free T4. How long do you take them off of the non-steroid? If they don't need to be on the NSAID, I would take them off for about three weeks. So if we look at the overall accuracy of t total T4 by itself, the problem is the specificity is down at 75%. So that's our biggest problem with relying on that uh, test by itself. Now we talked in the beginning about the dogs with lymphocytic thyroiditis and anti-thyroid love in positive dogs uh, who had normal thyroid function. So what happened is that Michigan State pulled a bunch of these dog samples, contacted the vets and said, you know, you have an antibody positive dog with normal thyroid test. Every year, send me a blood sample so we can look and see what happened. And what they found was that 20% of thyroid globulin antibody positive dogs who were asymptomatic progressed to hypothyroidism within one year. And within four years, they were virtually all hypothyroid. So eventually, once the autoimmune disease starts, it progresses. And there is data in humans and in rats that trying to treat them with steroids to stop the autoimmune process doesn't work. So once it starts within the thyroid, it's going to be uh, perpetuated. So because of the problem of total T4 and all the things that mess up total T4, people started looking at, well, let's measure free T4, the non-protein bound part of thyroxin, the part that gets uh, transported into the cell and gets converted into the metabolically active hormone. We know that there's a linear correlation between the amount of free T4 in the blood and the metabolic rate of the animal. And we know that the concentration of free T4 is inversely correlated with the log of the concentration of TSA, which means a small drop in free T4 causes a marked rise in pituitary release of TSA. The problem with uh, free T4 testing is it's a pain. Um, so what we do is we take the blood sample, we literally dialyze it. So the serum goes into a dialysis chamber, we spin it at a high speed for a long time, Anything that's protein bound stays on one side of the membrane and we throw it away. Anything that's non-protein bound diffuses through the membrane into the bottom of the tube. And then we run a very sensitive monoclonal antibody against T4, against that tiny amount of stuff that's laying in the bottom. That's less than 1% of the total amount of T4 that's in the blood sample. 
and that's doing a step called equilibrium or direct dialysis. The problem was is that um, many labs were all, our lab, IDEX, other labs were all using a free T4 dialysis kit uh, marketed by Nichols Institute, uh, which is a company that manufactures diagnostic kits. They don't run tests, they just make kits. And a couple of years ago, you may have gotten a letter from us and IDEX saying that we can't measure free T4 anymore. Because what happened, Nichols said, they don't use this test in people anymore, we're just gonna quit. We're just gonna quit making it. And us and IDEX and other labs called him and said, what the hell, you know, we buy a lot of this stuff from you, you know, we can make this work for you financially. And they said, yeah, we really don't care about dogs, we're getting out of the business, we're gonna do something else. And so, they're up in San Juan Capistrano, so we drove up there and said, hey, you know, I don't think you're listening. <laughs> you know, this is like crazy important. We need to keep making these kits, and we're going to keep buying them, and we're going to have a great relationship. And they said, you're not listening. Yeah, we don't care. And we went back and forth and back and forth, and then one day I said, you know, you don't realize something. We're the evil empire, and we are going to buy you. And so the next day we did. So we went and bought Nichols Institute. Now we are the provider of all free T4 dialysis kits in the United States. So any free T4 that's being done by ED, we're selling them those labs, those kits, uh, just like Nichols was. So don't screw with the evil empire, um, because we will come and get you. If you look at the accuracy of free T4 testing, it's very nice. You know, sensitivity is 98, specificity is 94. As you know, as you get towards 100 and either one of those, you're going to decrease the other. Overall accuracy is 95%. Ridiculous. Doesn't really get much better than that. So the real value of the free T4 is in those dogs. Again, not as a screen, but in the dogs where the total T4 is less than 1.5. What we really want is this. We want a TSA test. So that's what they have in people. So when you go in or I go in and we get our thyroid tested, they don't measure T4, they don't measure free T4, they measure TSA. If your TSH is normal, you're normal. If your TSH is low, you're hyperthyroid or you're taking too much supplement. If your TSH is high, you're hypothyroid. And then they figure out why you're hypo. The human assays don't work in dogs. And so several years ago, two uh, groups, Michigan State and then a company called Diagnostic Products Corporation, each simultaneously developed a canine TSA test. And what they did is they took dogs, gave them radioactive iodine, made them hypothyroid, measured their TSH, and what they found was as they became hypothyroid, their T4s went down, the TSH went up. When you supplemented them, the TSH went down, the T4 came up. Literally, we were <coughs> leaky in the audience. The holy grail of veterinary endocrinology had been delivered. And then the nastiness of the real world stepped in. And what we realized when you started screening hundreds of thousands of dogs is that 25% of drop-dead hypothyroid dogs did not have a high TSH, they had a normal one. And this is the same issue that they ran into in humans when they developed the first human TSH assay. And now they're on like their 11 TSH assay. The problem is, is that certain dogs secrete different uh, forms of TSH, and the monoclonal antibody doesn't recognize them. So because of this, we don't use TSH to diagnose anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just like a total T4. Yep. In humans, is there a percentage that have normal TSH but are hypothyroid? Hypothyroid? Yeah. Oh, it'd be like 0.002%. Oh, so almost Yes, okay. it's ridiculously good. Yeah. And someday we'll get there. The problem is we need somebody to want to develop that sort of a kit. We need a company, I guess we have to go buy another company uh, and say you need to make a TSH assay. Because the problem is if you look at sensitivity of the TSH assay, it becomes 76%. <clears throat> so you can't use it as a screen. Some labs, including our own, offer you thyroid profiles which have T4, TSH, and free T4 by ED. Yeah, don't do that one. Don't check that box. Um, because the problem is, is that the TSH always screws that up so that the sensitivity and the accuracy drop. The way to go always is free T4 by dialysis. If you want to know if the dog's hypothyroid or not, you call and say, what's this free T4? Um, the TSH is, at this point, until we get a better assay, is just not helpful. Can we evaluate thyroid function in dogs that are sick? The answer is no. There you go. See? You don't even have to read the slide. Can't do it. <laughs> so wait until they recover from whatever their illness is. If you still think they're hypothyroid, then bring them back. Who has CBT1? CBT1? Dude. <laughs> we need to chat. 
<laughs> hey, there's like you're like the one person in the last four years who owns CBT one, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long time ago. Yeah, I've seen parts of CBT one, like I found half of it where they ripped apart. Um, mm -hmm. What color was it? It's kind of kind of like your shirt, it's kind of orange. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So CBT one is the holy grail of veterinary technology. It may be that in fact there is no such thing. That CBT two is actually the original, and CBT one was made up. I don't know. Somewhere in CBT1, though, it says that the dose of thyroid hormone for the dog is a tenth of a milligram per ten pounds twice a day. We have no idea where that came from, because there is no data to support that dose. Somebody invented it. Whoever wrote that chapter made it up. And I think they made it up because the tablets came in a tenth of a milligram tablets. And it seemed like if you give four tablets to a 40-pound dog, they grow hair. And they didn't fall over dead. Therefore, that's the dose. So for 50 years, that's how we've been dying dosing dogs with thyroid hormone. Now, when this TSH assay business was happening in dogs, some really smart people, Duncan Ferguson being one of them, who's a DBM, ACBIM, he's got four billion letters behind his name, said, this is ridiculous. There has to be a dose for God's sake. And so what he did is he took a bunch of these hypothyroid dogs and asked the question, what dose of thyroid hormone is necessary to take a dog with a high TSH and make his TSH normal? And that's the dose that is the dose that your pituitary is saying is okay. So we took a bunch of different dosages, once a day, twice a day, a different bunch of milligram doses, and figured out that the frickin' dose was a tenth of a milligram per ten. <laughs> Scary. But it was only once a day. Dogs only eat thyroid hormone once a day. Now, the first question is, well, how can that be? If the half-life is 10 to 16 hours, why do they only need once a day dosing? That's because that's the serum half-life of thyroxine, not, to, not the intracellular half-life of thyroxine. So what happens is, yeah, it's only in the plasma for 10 to 16 hours, but it goes into the cell almost immediately, gets converted to free T3, gets binds to the nuclear receptor and exerts its biologic effect. So now we've got several papers looking at SID dosing of thyroxine at a tenth of a milligram for 10 pounds, and it works just great. So we probably don't need to dose at DID. Now, what do you do with the four billion dogs who are on DID dosing? Um, and it just, there is no real good medical, the medical answer is they don't need it to take them off. The psychological answer is owners hate that kind of crap. It's like, why are we changing it? Why? I want my money back for the last nine years of DID dosing. So what we tell people is now is that we kind of sneak it by them. They come in for a refill, we go, Oh, we're just going to refill this, but we're just going to do it once a day and see if they have a history. And most of them just go, oh, once a day, is that okay? And we go, yeah, that's fine. They go, oh, okay, that's good. We don't get into a big explanation. For the people that get all agitated about it and they say, no, no, he's doing fine, I don't want to change it, just refill it and know that that second dose is being defecated out like a rocket. So probably it really doesn't matter. But a tenth of a milligram per 10 pounds once a day, and a tenth of a milligram per 10 pounds once a day it takes two weeks to make a hypothyroid dog biochemically new thyroid. So once you start them on thyroid hormone supplementation, if you're going to do something to monitor them, which we'll talk about whether you need to do that or not, but if you are going to do something to monitor them, you have to wait at least two weeks before you can assess thyroid function on them. And that's little dogs, big dogs, and forget about surface area? Yeah, so very good. The question is about weight, and, and we should bring that up. Um, they, some caveats to that are never give more than 0.8 milligrams per dog, irrespective of size. So a dog that weighs 140 pounds gets 0.8 milligrams. Because it looks like, irrespective of the size, because it is a drug that's regulating metabolic rate, probably is a surface area effect. And at 0.8 milligrams, you're saturating all of the binding protein sites that's available in that dog. So it's a 10 milligram per 10 pounds up to a maximum of 0.8 milligrams per day. And for little dogs, we just dose them at a tenth of a milligram. Can I say a If you have a huge dog, like I have, I have a client with 150, 155 pound Akita, mm -hmm. and when he was on 0.8 twice a day, he, his hair was still a little tufty and wasn't very growing, and his, his post pill T4 was like 1.5. Mm -hmm. And we upped him to. Which 1. is normal. Which is normal, yeah, but, yeah, but low and normal. Right. And, it, and he was definitively low. Mm -hmm. uh, and when he was on 1.4 milligrams twice a day, his hair grew back and his T4 was like 3.5 and he had better energy and mm -hmm. stopped getting as many pyodermas. And now he's an almost normal coat. 
I mean, so what about, I mean, that seems like evidence-wise that that, that particular job needed more than You're going to tell me that's evidence? On that one job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's the, here's the, here's the thing. I, I cannot argue that your dog got better <coughs> on a, a toxic dose of thyroid. <laughs> so there's a couple of reasons why that could happen. One is you have a dog that doesn't absorb it, um, thyroxin. And that can happen in dogs who are taking tablets that have dye. So if you have any dog who's taking a tablet that has a color to it, and they're, and they're having a poor response, get them off of that, put them on a tablet that doesn't have a color in it. Because we think that there's an issue with them. The other possibility is, is that that dog, because it's Nikita, is a hypothyroid dog who probably also has some other primary skin disorder. Because um, we know that if you take dogs with seborrhea, who are euthyroid and give them thyroid hormone, they grow hair. And that's because the hormone, what you're doing at that dose is you're giving them an anabolic. So you're causing their hair coat and their skin turnover to be accelerated, not necessarily because they're hypothyroid, but just because you gave them a non-specific anabolic hormone. So I just shot two major holes in your head of one. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't think he was. The, the way to know for sure is to do this. So the first question is, why do you want to know what the animal's T4 is when he's on replacement therapy? If you have a dog who is hypothyroid, confirmed hypothyroid, on an appropriate dose, those clinical signs went away, and he wasn't showing any signs of hyper. He's not PUPD, polyphagic, in fact, a part of losing weight. That's the dose. I would just leave him alone, not do anything. If you want to know if he's truly euthyroid biochemically, then what some people like to do, including our own laboratory, which suffers from many mental handicaps, is post-pill T4 testing, which is the dumbest thing on the face of the planet. And the reason it's dumb is because it makes absolutely no biologic sense at all. And the reason it makes no sense is because of something called bioavailability of T4, the percent of thyroxine that's absorbed after a single oral dose. There's a paper from 35 years ago that gave dogs a single oral dose of thyroid hormone, eight dogs, and measured their T4s every hour for eight hours. And in those eight dogs, five of the dogs peaked at four hours post pill. That became the hallmark for when we should measure T4. However, numerous studies since then have shown that dogs absorb 13 to 87 percent of the tablet, and that that varies in a given dog from day to day. So on Tuesday, they absorb 13 percent. On Wednesday, they absorb 87 percent. Shockingly, their T4 post pill is radically different depending on how you do it. So if you want to know really what the thyroid hormone status is of a dog who's on replacement, you have two choices. You can measure free T4 by dialysis, which doesn't matter what time of day you take the sample, doesn't matter when you take it in relationship to the pill, as long as they've been on it for at least two weeks, it's flat. Or you can measure TSH in that dog. Again, doesn't matter when you do it, time of day, relative to the tablet, Again, they have to be on the medication for at least two weeks. But the caveat to the TSH test is that in order to know what a normal TSH means post-treatment, you need to know what the TSH was pre-treatment. Because it had to be high pre-treatment to now say that's the appropriate dose post-treatment. And since I'm telling you not to do the TSH pre-treatment, you're screwed. So you basically now have one choice, and that's to measure free T4 by now. If your free T4 by ED after being on supplement for at least two weeks is low, he needs more. If the free T4 is normal, he's euthyroid, and whatever else is wrong with him is not related to hypothyroidism. So now you go look for something else that's causing that symptom. And if his free T4 by ED is high, he needs less, even if he's not showing overt signs of thyroid toxicosis. But I think most of the animals that are out there probably don't need routine T4 testing because you're just you should just ignore it. And if you're doing post pill testing, you should stop it. And the reference ranges that we give for post pill T4 being different than regular is invented. I mean, we just made that shit up. So that makes absolutely no sense. Um, I mean, we sat around in the room and said this makes no sense, and some people said it makes sense, and therefore uh, it's out there. But don't do it. And the only way I can impact the lab is to impact the marketing people, is to convince the marketing people we don't need a test, is, to, is for you guys not to order the test. Because what they tell me is, we have to do post phone monitoring because that's ordered all the time, they love it. And I say, you know what, if you freaking took it off of the session, they wouldn't be able to order the test anymore. 
Or we could put out a thing that's a box that says, check this box if you want irrelevant information. <laughs> <laughs> and if you could get owners to pay for that, then that would be stupid. So, um, it, assuming that we're not going to do that, um, that, <laughs> that, you're not gonna that, that, that we're not going to listen to you, yeah. Um, the total T4 Very has no, no, no. no value at all. Zero. Some okay. minus value. It tells you what his T4 is that day. I have two questions regarding core absorption. As far as giving the pill, is it important to give it without a meal on an empty stomach? Probably. And if you do have a dog who has core absorption and you are using a colored pill, which mm -hmm. I am for my dog, and yeah. I've had them on a higher dose than you're okay. recommending, so, yeah. and T4 was low until I bumped up, or free T4. It was he low. was low okay. until I bumped up the dose. Um, so I am monitoring based on that. Um, what brands are not dyed? Most of the generics. generics. And most of the point ones, non veterinary or not colored. Um, so the problem is you're going to have to get a lot of tablets uh, in order to do it. Um, because most of the tablets that are higher strengths than point one are colored to differentiate them from a point one tablet. So virtually all the pills you're going to look at are going to be colored. Your other choice is to use the liquid. There is a liquid formulation, uh, which is very readily absorbed. And there is a chewable formulation as well. Um, but I haven't really seen all, I mean, I've seen data when they um, published their initial thing. But I don't know if making it a chewable makes it more or less absorbable uh, than being a non-chewable. Um, it does work in most of the dogs, but I don't know if you had a dog who wasn't absorbing a regular pill, if they would absorb the chewable form any better. So the liquid, there, they would absorb better. Is there a particular brand that tends to be more across the board? Well, in humans, they've looked at, in, in human medicine, they've looked at generic versus name brand, and name brands being Synthroid and Siloxone. No difference between Synthroid and Siloxone and generic in terms of uh, clinical response. We've looked, and we have not looked at clinical response, no one's done that, but we've looked at absorption of Synthroid versus Siloxone versus generic. If you look at large populations, it doesn't seem to make any difference, but if you look at an individual patient, there are definitely patients that do better on name brand than do on generic. Um, and I think that's just because of whatever the other ingredients are in there, may be interfering with that particular dog's ability to absorb. So if you're having an issue, I'd go name brand, and I'd go with no dye, if humanly possible. Which would be separate? Probably. Or slots and point ones. Yeah. Go, go with that. After your um, two to three week primary monitoring, do you still recommend the six month monitoring, or do you just kind of drop that off? And I would probably just leave them alone at that point. Okay. And you know, if once a year when they're coming in for their annual, if you want to do something, if you think that he's showing signs of hypo, and you want it to know, I would just do a free T4 okay. and sort it out. The only downside of doing free over total is it's more expensive. Right. But the reality is you're not learning anything from the total. So it's kind of very expensive. Uh, I have two dogs, two sharp heads. <laughs> you personally? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one's on 0.4 milligrams, and one's on 0.5 twice a day. So you're saying just to drop down to once a day? I drop them once. Okay. Yeah. And then maybe uh, maybe two weeks from the time to drop. Uh, Tested. If you want to, if you, either you can just see how they do clinically and, and not do anything, or I wait at least two weeks and do a free T4 by dialysis to make sure it's normal, that the free T4 is normal. When you're saying that the testing of the free T4 is uh, irrelevant as far as dogs are concerned, what about cats with uh, hyperthermia? What tests you want to do with free T4? Oh, for cats with hyperthermia that are being treated? Yeah. Uh, you can just do total. Um, as long as what you're going for in a cat is if you if you get the total T4 below two and a half, you should be bringing the free T4 down into normal. Um, so as long as you're doing that, you're probably doing it. The issue that we have with cats is that we don't really know what to do with cats who are living in that 60 to 90 range. Um, because most of those cats only scan them normal. So I would just go off the total. Do you supplement side pounds at the same rate that you do uh, one side pounds? Yeah, we supplement them at the same uh, 10 milligram for 10 pounds. Yeah. Um, 
I know what you're going to say, but we have several. Well, why don't you ask the question? <laughs> <laughs> we have several dogs that we dropped from the twice a day to the once a day, and clinically it made a difference. Okay. Did there, what was our free key for us? Thank you. Next, next question. No, the other no, I'm not hearing you. Okay, so here's the, here's the thing. If I give you a 10 milligram for 10 pounds DID of thyroxin, and you're also take a 10 milligram once a day of thyroxin, you're going to feel different. And if I take it away from you down to once a day, you'll feel the effects of the anabolic is out of your body. So my guess is you're probably absolutely right that those dogs felt differently. But my guess is they're euthyroid. So the only way to know if that's happening, that by lowering the dose, you truly adversely affect the thyroid function is to measure it. And the only way to measure it accurately is to measure free. Yeah. So it needs to be, you can't really test thyroid function in a sick dog. Right. But once, let's say you do test it, and you know the dog is sick, like, like I have one client whose dog has lymphangiectasia. Um, but if it comes back with like your classic low, like the, the TSH was 4.17, the CT4 was 2, the T4 was less than 0.5, the thyroid body and autoantibodies were 125%. Um, okay. Okay. I mean, those so, are all pretty classic. Yeah, he's, he's got the disease. So. Yeah. Yeah. Even though he's sick, he's got you know, low albumin and all, and all that. The problem's so, going to be, well, first of all, there would be a couple problems. One would be if his albumin's low, all his TBG. So okay. dosing him is going to be a bit of a challenge. So you're going to have to monitor his three T fours because I don't know what dose to tell you to give him because you're going to saturate TBG pretty fast because he's only got probably half of what he's supposed to have. So you won't be able to look at total to monitor him. You can't look at total in dogs that are antibody positive because the antibody positive thyroid blood in dogs, their antibody cross reacts with the total. So your T4 is going to be higher than what you think it is. So I think that with, in your dog, he's got evidence of thyroiditis, he has evidence of hypothyroidism biochemically. I don't know what it has to do with his disorder. I don't know if he'll benefit from you know, thyroid hormone replacement. But if you treat him, I would treat him at the same, I would treat him at um, half the dose and then measure free T4 in like two to three weeks and see where you are. Because I just don't know. And if his lymph agitation resolves and his proteins go up, is he, is he on steroid? Yeah, he just Okay. But but his that was, well, but his is up too, so he's absorbing some of it. I mean, for sure. So was the thyroid test pre budesonide or post? Unfortunately, it's post. Oh, so that's so. Oh, now now you messed up my entire theory. <laughs> so now I wouldn't treat the dog because the low total, the low free, uh, the high TSH could all be budesonide. Really. Even with the thyroid antibodies. The thyroid antibodies just means thyroiditis. Doesn't mean it's hypothyroid. So it doesn't mean you need supplementation. So it only portion of the is absorbed, but he it's could enough. absorb enough from that. And he's crazy PUPD, and he's obviously absorbing the systemically. Yeah, he is. He's, yeah. So he, how much is he on? Three milligrams? The budesonide, yeah, uh, yeah. we dropped it to once a day because he was so PUPD. Oh uh, yeah, we, you should only use it once a day. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that dog now, I would just say he's at this time. You don't really know what's going on with this thyroid. I would say he's, he's an anti-thyroid globulin positive dog. Um, but I wouldn't treat him because I think it's going to be fraught with a mess trying to figure out the dose, and then I'd be worried about making him hyper. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you should probably have breed specific uh, ranges. Right. Our colleague who uses the Gene Dodds lab. Oh, mother. <laughs> what What you should tell her is to run screaming into the woods. Okay. <laughs> She's a super, super, super smart human being. Great, a great hematologist, a great coagulation person, a dog breeder, very weird in thyroid. So I would, I would, I would just look at whatever she's struggling on the form and say, yeah, no, none of that makes sense. So that would be, I would just stamp reject on it. And say, I would find someone else to interpret those results. Yeah, because she has a very peculiar dosing scheme and range. Not universally accepted. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. You keep saying free T4 by TB. Yes. Idex has a, a different <gasps> methodology. Oh, no. Seriously. You, you I was, was like, like we're eight minutes over. I still have to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will preface this by saying I work with Evil Empire. Um, 
I actually used to buy all the reagents from us. I think one of the motivations of doing the assay they're running so they don't have to buy reagents from the, the problem is, is that that methodology was looked at 20 years ago and it doesn't work. Um, it works fine in normal dogs. Um, so normal dogs are equal. Uh, free T4 dialysis versus non equilibrium dialysis method. Hypothyroid dogs, that's where it becomes a mess. And if you're hypothyroid because of protein binding abnormalities, medications, anti-thyroid antibodies, that test will not work. And in fact, even they admit that if they're not sure, they're going to run it by ED. And if you don't like the result you get back with the other, they'll flip around and run it by ED. It's the same cost. Right now, so yeah, I would just run it by ED. Yeah, I mean, it's way, it is definitely a more accurate test than you run it by dialysis. And even if, before we weren't the only people, I would probably run it by dialysis. Definitely a better one. So until we have a TSH assay that's better than that, I think we're kind of stuck with that. So we don't like it. Nobody likes it. It's a pain. It's not a good test. The facts say that everybody likes it. Okay. All right. So you're totally screwed now with <laughs> thyroid. So that's usually how we end it. I'd say we made it more confusing. If the answer is yes, that accomplished my job. All right. Enjoy the rest of your.